This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Mises Weekends once again. This weekend, our show features a fantastic talk from Dr. Hans Hermann Hoppe at a Mises Institute event about 10 years ago in 2006. The talk is entitled A World Without Theft. And in this talk, Hoppe touches on many of the same topics and themes he touches on in this fantastic book, The Economics and Ethics of Private Property. This is a seminal piece of work, something that every Austro-Libertarian needs to own and read. It absolutely helped my own thinking uh, in areas of property and ethics and socialism and laissez-faire. And again, Dr. Hoppe touches on some of the themes in this book in the talk. Uh, If you have not yet signed up, for our 35th anniversary gala event that is happening in New York this October. Please do so because it's going to be your only chance to see Hoppe live in the United States in 2017. It will be his only appearance in this country. Uh, he will, of course, speak about Rothbard and his relationship with Rothbard. You can go to Mises.org events to sign up for our 35th gala. But in the meantime, enjoy this fantastic talk from Dr. Hoppe and have a great weekend. What they did have was a superabundance of goods. And if you have a superabundance of goods, then it is impossible that uh, human beings have any conflicts with each other, because uh, what should they fight about if there exists a superabundance of things? Uh, except, of course, in two regards, even in the Garden of Eden, problems would exist, namely uh, with regard to our own physical bodies. Uh, that is still scarce. We have only one of them, not millions. Um, and, uh, of course, the standing room on which our physical bodies rest. And insofar as scarcity exists, even in the Garden of Eden, in, this, in these two regards, conflicts are possible. And because conflicts are possible, it would be, even in the Garden of Eden, necessary to have certain rules uh, in order to avoid these conflicts. And the rules would have to be rules uh, assigning rights of exclusive control, rights of uh, ownership, with regard to scarce resources, namely our bodies. And what the rules would be most likely uh, adopt in the Garden of Eden would be every person is the owner of his own physical body and can do whatever he wants with his own physical body. And anybody else who wants to do something to me or I want to do something to somebody else, he would need the permission um, of uh, of the owner. And the second rule that we would need is uh, I can move around wherever I want, uh, but I cannot try to occupy, occupy a space that has already been occupied by someone else. Uh, and outside of the Garden of Eden, uh, where we have all around scarcity and uh, all sorts of conflicts can arise, uh, we would uh, also need rules that avoid conflicts in this situation, and again, uh, without uh, going into a, a very detailed uh, explanation, what sort of rules would be most likely adopt outside of the Garden of Eden? That would be, again, uh, every person owns uh, his own physical body. We acquire the right of exclusive uh, control over scarce resources that were previously unowned by being the first one to put scarce resources to some uh, use. Uh, the third, third rule would be whoever uses his physical body and some originally appropriated previously unowned goods and further produces something uh, with the help of uh, his body and so forth would be the owner of whatever he has produced. And uh, the, final, uh, the final rule would be the rule that uh, Exclusive rights of control over scarce resources can also be acquired by transferring, voluntarily transferring ownership from a previous owner uh, to uh, to a later owner. Um, these uh, elementary rules um, are very old rules. Uh, through all of mankind, basically, these rules have been uh, recognized. They make intuitive uh, sense. We can even see them adhere to in the animal kingdom to a certain extent, uh, and we recognize that even small children, for instance, uh, recognize the rule that he who uses something first uh, becomes the owner of it, because whenever kids get into a fight, the first thing that they point out is, I played with the toy first, 
uh, and until I drop it, uh, you had better leave me, uh, leave me alone. Um, it should also be clear that the alternatives to these rules are rather absurd. Um, the first um, the, the first alternative to self ownership would be slavery, which is morally objectionable uh, as well as economically um, inefficient. Um, if the second uh, person coming along would become the owner of something, uh, then the second person would become the first because the first one wouldn't do it, um, and that is, has absurd consequences. If the first owner would have to share ownership with uh, other people, um, then again, conflicts would not be avoided. And in addition, uh, this would be uh, econ uh, economically uh, unproductive because the incentive to be the first would be reduced and so forth. Uh, the incentive to be the producer would be reduced if the producer would have to share his property uh, with those people who have not produced it and, uh, and so forth. Um, now, the next problem that then uh, arises is even if we recognize the truth, the morality, uh, the economic efficiency of these sorts of uh, uh, principles, um, uh, what do we do about those people who do not respect these rules? And, of course, there are always people who break these, uh, break these uh, rules. Um, that is, we need some institution that enforces uh, and threatens with punishment breakers of these uh, rules. And the traditional answer to the question, who is in charge of uh, enforcing these rules uh, and threatening potential uh, violators of these rules with punishment in case uh, they do not adhere to these rules, the traditional answer is, this is the task of, uh, of the state. Uh, this is the sole and only task of the state. Um, now, whether this answer is correct or not depends on what is the definition of the state. Um, the states are traditionally defined as uh, being a territorial monopolist of ultimate decision-making or ultimate arbitration in cases of conflict. Uh, in every case of conflict, the ultimate judge who is right and who is wrong is the state. And because the state is the monopolist of ultimate decision-making, the state has then, by implication, also the right uh, to say what the price for its uh, arbitration is, uh, and it can unilaterally impose what the price will be. That is to say, the state is also a territorial monopolist of taxation. Now, once we uh, have this definition of the state in front of us, uh, then it is not all that difficult to discover that there is something wrong with this answer to the question, who should enforce the rules that I initially explained. Um, first of all, we have a classical argument against any type of monopoly. Uh, and as I said, the state is a monopolist. He is the only one that can do such and such. Um, the classical argument against monopolist is um, whenever we do not have free entry into a specific line of production, in this case, um, the production line of arbitration, of police protection, and so forth, whenever we have uh, restrictions with regard to free entry, uh, then producers are no longer forced to produce at the lowest possible cost. Uh, as long as free entry exists, producers must produce at the lowest possible cost because otherwise it will invite competition uh, against them. Um, and uh, monopolists, because of that, uh, tend to be, from the point of view of consumers, uh, more pricey and the quality of their product uh, tends to be lower than it would be if competition existed in their uh, area of production. Um, but when it comes to the state, uh, matters are actually worse than in the case, let's say, of a milk monopoly, um, which would produce milk at uh, uh, above uh, minimum cost, price would be higher, quality of the milk would be lower. But in the case of the government, the problem is that governments do not just produce maybe lousy goods, uh, but they can actually produce bads. Um, Namely, in the following sense, um, because governments are the ultimate arbitrator in any type of conflict, governments can also cause conflicts uh, and then decide 
when it comes to who is right and who is wrong in the case of conflicts in their own favor. And given that they are human beings just like everyone else and realize this possibility, of course, they will cause conflicts and then decide the conflicts um, in their own favor, and then on top of it, they determine what the price of the victims of their misjustice uh, have to pay for this misservice of causing conflicts, deciding them in their own favor, and what the price for this must be. So this is a fundamental problem uh, with uh, having a state in charge of this particular task. And now that this problem is even compounded, um, if we have a democratic state uh, in front of us. Um, the classical liberals who, who proposed the state as a solution to the problem of social uh, conflicts um, uh, faced as their opponents um, uh, typically monarchical uh, governments, kings and, and queens. And they rejected the rule of kings and queens um, for the simple reason that they thought uh, that they had privileges, uh, that they were treated differently by the law than the rest of the people, uh, rest of the people were, and they advocated instead uh, that the state should be organized democratically by making the point that uh, if everyone can enter the state, not just some king or queen, um, then we have, so to speak, equality before the law. However, it turns out that this is, of course, a fundamental mistake to think that once you create open entry into every government position, that you have equality before the law. Uh, what actually happens is that if we... Uh, substitute a democracy for a monarchy is we replace uh, uh, personal privileges, privileges restricted to the king and queen and so forth, with uh, functional privileges, privileges uh, that are given to public officials. Um, but in fact, the distinction between higher law and a lower law exists under democracy just as much as it exists under monarchy. Um, uh, in the form of uh, two different types of law, one that we call public law uh, that covers, so to speak, the actions of public officials uh, and private law that covers uh, the activities of uh, private citizens. As a private citizen, you may not steal. As a public official, however, covered by public law, you can steal. Um, as uh, a private citizen, you may not enslave somebody else. Um, on the other hand, if you do the same as a public official, draft somebody into the army, for instance, uh, then that is perfectly uh, all right. Um, if you steal from somebody and give it to somebody else, uh, that is fence stolen goods, uh, this is considered to be under private law a crime. If you do it as a public official, it's called redistribution of income. Um, so under public law, you can do certain things that under private law would be considered to be illegal. So the distinction between two types of law still exists under democracy just as much as it exists um, under, uh, under monarchy. Uh, in addition, there are some more problems arising once we have a democracy. Um, what you do is you exchange somebody the king or queen who considers the country his own private property with somebody, a democratically elected politician, uh, who is the temporary caretaker uh, of public property. And now ask yourself, will this make a difference in terms of the behavior of these two individuals? And the answer, of course, it will make a fundamental difference. Uh, if you are the own, if you consider yourself the owner of a country, you will, as every private owner does, by and large be concerned about preserving or enhancing the value of the country. Uh, after all, you want to pass on something valuable to the next generation. Uh, you might even sell off some of this and are concerned about the price that you will get for whatever you sell off and so forth. On the other hand, if you are just a temporary caretaker uh, and not the owner of it, uh, then you will take the short-run perspective. I have to loot the country as fast as possible because I only have four years to do it and no chance, no chance afterwards. Uh, so you will be engaging in capital consumption rather than in the, uh, the, the preservation and the enhancement uh, of the capital value embodied 
um, in uh, in the country. Uh, in addition, it is frequently pointed out that, uh, but isn't it good that we have open entry into the position of governmental rulers under democracy, whereas entry into governmental positions uh, under monarchy is, rough, of course, restricted by um, accident of uh, of birth. Uh, now, what is wrong with this argument is the fact that, um, yes, uh, open entry is good as, as long as we are talking about the production of goods. Um, but open entry is not good once it comes to the production of bads. And I already explained that governments produce something bad. Uh, we would not want to have open competition in who is the best killer. We would not want to have competition who, who steals more effectively than, uh, than other people do. And when it comes to this, we notice some very important uh, difference. Um, a king might be bad. That is true, uh, as all governmental positions can be filled by bad people. But uh, because he is a member of a family, other family members will have an interest in containing people who are bad because they might just uh, uh, lose the, uh, the property that of, of the family might threaten uh, the position of the dynasty. And bad kings are typically surrounded by members of his own family, by an entourage that controls them. And if need be, they get killed if they just go out of line. And on the other hand, a king can be conceivably a good and decent person because it is just an accident of birth that he comes into his position. Um, but now we'll look at the, uh, a democratic politician. Um, a democratic politician um, can never be good um, because he has to just compete openly for this position and in order to be elected to this um, he must be a very good and proficient liar, cheater, um, somebody who is good in terms of qualities that we definitely do not want to have. So we might have good kings. We will never have anybody of any decent moral values ever uh, coming into the position uh, of president or prime minister or whatever it is. So now we come then to the question, um, what is the right answer to the question of how do we enforce the rules that I initially um, mentioned? Self-ownership, uh, first first use, uh, first own principle, producer owns whatever he has uh, produced, and the rule of you can acquire property through voluntary exchange. And the correct answer is um, the, the enforcement of these rules has to occur by individuals and agencies that are bound by the same rules as everybody else. Um, that is, we need a society where the only type of law that is in existence is private law. Uh, no such institution that is covered by public, uh, by public law, which, of course, as I explained, is a misnomer. That is not public law. That is just uh, um, uh, law or uh, uh, criminal activities masquerading as, uh, as law. Um, now, this, uh, if private, if the enforcement of these rules also has to occur by individuals and agencies bound by the same rules, involves then two things. On the one hand, um, unlimited rights, unlimited rights to self-defense um, must be permitted. Uh, and the immediate implication, of course, of this is uh, that private ownership of weapons and guns must be permitted in any free society. Um, and uh, despite everything that we always hear from uh, governments uh, in terms of contrary propaganda, uh, there is an intuitively sensible rule that says uh, the more guns there are, uh, the less crime will exist. And the Wild West, contrary to what some movies uh, insinuate, uh, is a clear indication of the fact that this is indeed the case. Uh, if people own guns, private, gun, private ownership of guns is unrestricted, then there will be less crime. But in complex societies, of course, um, we will not want to provide for our own security only by our own means. We do not uh, uh, make our own suits or shoes. Uh, we rely on the division of labor in this regard. And of course, in every complex society, we would want to rely on division of labor on specialized agencies 
uh, and agents also when it comes to the protection of, uh, of private property rights and a very important role in a free society when it comes to the protection of uh, these rules that I mentioned before uh, would be insurance agencies and associated with insur insurance agencies uh, directly or indirectly uh, police detective and arbitration uh, agencies. Now what would be the result of this and a very brief comparison um, between um, uh, the state provision of security um, and uh, the provision of security by um, um, by uh, privately funded, freely funded uh, insurance uh, operations. Uh, the first thing would be there would be a drastic fall uh, in the price that we have to pay um, uh, for, secu uh, for security. Um, as I explained, the tendency for under uh, monopolistic provision of security is the price of security always goes up. We have to pay more and more, and we get low lower and lower quality of, uh, of protection. Precisely the opposite would occur um, if there were competition in this area. The second, um, the second um, fundamental change that would occur um, with regard to um, uh, how much security should be produced. Um, uh, every resource that is expended on providing us with security can no longer be used to provide us with other uh, things. Um, uh, money spent on uh, on security can no longer be spent on uh, on vacations on beer and wine and food and w whatever it is. Um, normally, people decide voluntarily based on their own judgment how important security is to them as compared to um, other needs that they might have. Um, if you have government deciding for you how much security you need. Um, they will, of course, decide the more I can spend, uh, the better uh, the better it is. That this involves a restriction of uh, um, uh, satisfaction of other needs is of no concern. Uh, of no concern. That is, if we have competition in this area, there will be no overproduction um, of uh, security. Um, the next point I want to emphasize is. Would there be um, a large amount of uh, money, resources expended on victimless crimes if we had competing insurance agencies wanting to protect us? Uh, as we all know, currently huge amounts of resources are expended on combating victimless crimes such as drug use, uh, prostitution, gambling, uh, whatever it is. Uh, but it should be perfectly clear that uh, as much as many people dislike these type of activities, uh, since these activities are victimless crimes and we are not directly affected in our own property by the existence of these types of activities, very few people would be willing uh, to spend uh, huge amounts of money uh, to be protected from something that they do not see as a threat. Uh, insurance agencies that would want to protect you against these sorts of things would obviously have to charge higher premiums than insurance companies that would abstain from protecting you against these things. And since most people are not affected by such things, uh, insurance companies that would offer uh, services such as this would likely go out of business very quickly. So victimless crimes would tend to be treated for what they are, namely as not a big deal at all, and uh, uh, likely no uh, persecution of uh, uh, the perpetrators of victimless crimes would, uh, would occur. Um, more important than this is the following. Um, uh, insurance companies would indemnify you uh, in case they fail in the task uh, that they have uh, accepted in return for you paying a premium. Um, governments, on the other hand, monopolists, of course, do not indemnify you if they fail. Uh, 
if somebody steals from you, uh, robs you, mistreats you, and so forth, the government will not come and say, look, we failed in what we promised to do, and because we failed you, we will offer you compensation of such and such an amount. I have at least never heard of any government anywhere doing anything like this, um, and I'm sure that you have never heard anything like this also. Um, why would insurance companies be good at this? Uh, they would be good at prevention of crime because whatever they can prevent, they would not have to pay up for it. Um, a government police officer, on the other hand, if he does, does fail to prevent a crime, uh, he gets his salary paid uh, no matter what. Um, and uh, in this situation, it is, of course, better to hang around at uh, 7-Eleven stores than just trying to prevent uh, what he's supposed to prevent. Um, when it comes to the next thing that we want is we want things that have been stolen, taken from us, and so forth, returned to us, if at all possible. Uh, what is the incentive of governmental police uh, to find stolen, uh, stolen goods, to find the loot, um, you know, anyone who has any experience with this know, knows that uh, the police will file a report and then you ask them what will you do about these goods and they will say no, we'll, we'll file it away. Um, and that's the end of uh, that's the end of the story. Um, by accident, sometimes things might be recovered, but only by accident. Um, what incentive, on the other hand, exists for insurance companies to recover things? The answer is because they otherwise have to indemnify you. Of course, they have a financial incentive to recover whatever they can recover at uh, at reasonable uh, cost. I had a, an acquaintance whose uh, VW got stolen in Italy. Um, he went to the Italian police and asked them, what will you do about it? And they said, nothing. Um, and then he reported this to an insurance company, and a week later, the insurance detective discovered where his car was. Of course, the car was pretty much worthless also, but nonetheless, you can see there's an entirely different incentive in both, uh, in both cases. Um, and the last thing that you want, of course, is like uh, that the perpetrators of the crime are found and captured, and that they have to compensate uh, the victim. Um, now, how likely is it that the government finds uh, the perpetrators in capital crimes? Yes, they do occasionally uh, find them because public uh, public uh, opinion pressure is quite uh, quite high uh, in crimes of a lesser uh, lesser sort. Rarely, if ever, uh, do they apprehend the criminal. And if they do apprehend the criminal, uh, what will they do uh, with the criminal? Will they force the criminal to now compensate the victims? And again, I have never heard of this. Quite to the contrary, they will probably jail um, jail the person uh, and uh, the uh, victim plus other taxpayers are forced to even pay for the incarceration of the person who victimized them in the first place. And if I remember correctly, uh, incarceration in the United States per person uh, per year cost about seventy thousand seventy thousand dollars or in the neighborhood of this um, there you can just uh, engage in physical workouts you have TV you can complain if you don't get your right muesli in the morning um, and uh, you might even study law uh, to prepare yourself for the next um, uh, apprehension um, you know how to better defend uh, defend yourself um, and and all the rest of it and does the victim ever see a penny out of this and the the answer is, of course, never ever. Um, would insurance companies operate like this? Imagine an insurance company would tell you, this is the condition under which I uh, insure you. Uh, as soon as we apprehend the criminal, uh, we will ask you also just to pay for his incarceration. Um, I don't think that insurance companies would get very far with, uh, with this type of uh, treatment. Um, Next point, um, how about the point of uh, disarmament of the public? Um, as we all know, governments, of course, always disarm people. Um, in the United States, we are not as uh, progressive as in many, uh, many other countries, uh, but we are definitely moving in the direction of uh, disarming the citizenry uh, increasingly um, also. Um, and it should be perfectly clear that a business 
that is in the business of uh, taxing you is interested in disarming those people that they want to uh, tax. But now imagine that you would go to an insurance company and the first uh, question that they ask you, do you have any arms, weapons, dangerous objects at home? And you say, yes, I do. And they would say, but the first condition attached to insuring you is that you have to hand over all of these things to me. Um, I think everyone except the moron would immediately recognize that there must be something suspicious about an agency such as this that wants to disarm you first as a condition of protecting you after uh, of protecting you afterwards. Um, quite to the contrary, insurance agencies would actually encourage you to own guns and to prove to them that you know how to safely handle these uh, these instruments uh, and would likely offer you a reduction in your premium that you have to pay if you can show that you are uh, proficient in the handling of uh, uh, of instruments of uh, of self defense um, just as insurance companies offer you a reduction in the premium if you have a safe at home uh, as compared to just uh, um, storing your family heirlooms on top of the kitchen table, um, so they would likely offer you uh, a reduction in premium if you can show them, yes, I own a gun, yes, I have a training course, yes, I have a certificate that uh, shows that I know to hand, how to handle these things and so forth. So a very different type of treatment you would get there. Moreover, insurance companies are by their very nature defensive organizations. And I should emphasize this because states, of course, are by their very nature aggressive institutions. Because uh, given that all people have a certain inclination to be aggressive, some people more than others, but assuming, so to speak, a natural inclination of being aggressive, if you can externalize the cost of being aggressive onto other people, that is, um, I don't have to pay all the price myself for being aggressive, pay my own bodyguards, pay for my own weapons, but I can make other people to, uh, to pay for my own aggression, which I can, of course, once I can tax people, then I will tend to be more aggressive than I would naturally be. Um, insurance companies who cannot resort to taxation must, because of this, be defensive. Um, Aggression is an expensive um, proposition, and you will have to charge higher premiums if you engage in aggressive activities. Uh, if you charge higher premiums, then, of course, you will tend to be less attractive. Most people will prefer not to be insured with aggressive agencies, but with defensive agencies, because this is, um, um, this is less, uh, less costly. Um, and not only this, insurance companies will also make it as make it as a requirement of all the clients that they insure that they themselves should engage in non-aggressive behavior. No insurance company would cover the risk, for instance, that I provoke you, then you retaliate, and then I go to my insurance company and complain about you having attacked me. Um, instead, they would just say, look, you provoked first, and then retaliation uh, ensued, and risks of this nature will not be, uh, will not be covered. Um, so as a condition of insurance, they will impose on you a code of conduct that forces you to accept um, um, a behavioral style that is civilized, so to speak. That will also include that insurance companies will most likely insist that you do not engage, engage in vigilante justice. Not that self-defense under certain circumstances would be excluded, but in order to make... Uh, uh, retaliation and uh, uh, permanent conflict to, to rule that out as far as possible. They would insist, if something has happened, please come to us and there will be some sort of uh, um, uh, regular procedure set in, uh, set in motion in order to avoid any uh, unnecessary um, uh, conflicts. Um, furthermore, if we would have competition in the protection um, protection of private property rights, um, we will get on the one hand 
a greater variety of law, and on the other hand, as I will explain in a minute, uh, a greater unification um, of law. What will happen on the one hand is there might be insurance agencies or protection agencies that offer you uh, to apply, let's say, canon law. Uh, there might be others that offer um, to uh, apply mosaic law. There might be others that uh, uh, propose to use uh, Islamic law and so forth. Um, these um, uh, rules uh, would only apply, of course, to people who are insured with the same company. Everybody in being insured with one company knows these are the laws that will apply to me and everybody else who is insured with the same with the same company. They agree to this type of law and the law procedures. Uh, so there we have, would have a greater variety of laws. Everybody could live, so to speak, under those rules that he uh, wants to accept in his own case. On the other hand, of course, conflicts can also arise between members that are insured by different law agencies that have internally different types of law codes. And it should be perfectly clear that in conflicts between members of different types of law codes, then uh, in order to resolve their conflicts, uh, we would have to have independent arbitration. Um, and in these independent arbitration of interagency uh, conflicts, there then a tendency would emerge of hammering out uh, the principles of procedures, punishment, uh, uh, conflict resolution and so forth that can be said to be truly universal. Um, that is, so to speak, the smallest common denominator uh, uh, uniting, combining all the different internal law codes um, uh, that uh, that exist. So we would get a greater variety of law and at the same time uh, uh, an enormous incentive to create um, a unified uh, international type of uh, private uh, private law developed by uh, arbitration agencies competing against each other in cases of interagency um, arbitration. Which brings me to my last point, um, that is to say, um, in such a situation with competing insurance providers, um, we would first of all get contracts offered about what will be done in what cases. Currently, when it comes to the question, do we get any contracts offered? Uh, the answer is, of course, no, there is no contract offered at all. Uh, the government only promises to do something, um, but they never say what exactly it is that they will do. And in addition, they even change the rules of the game as they go along. They engage in legislation. They change the laws. Uh, something that might be legal today might be illegal tomorrow and uh, vice versa. An insurance company that would say, okay, we will not promise you exactly what we will do and also we will reserve the right to change the rules of procedure as we go along without, you, if, without your consent, again, would not be able to get a single, uh, a single client to agree to such a thing. Um, and an insurance company would have to, have, have to offer a contract that has provisions first for the first contingency that everyone can foresee, that is, what will you do in case I have a conflict with somebody insured by you just as you insure me? That is, what would you do in cases if two clients of yours uh, have a conflict with each other? Obviously, the contract would have to have provisions what to do in this case. And secondly, uh, these contracts provided by insurance companies would also have to have provisions. What do you do in cases when I have a conflict with a member of a different insurance agency. Um, and uh, in order to be believable, uh, they must have a provision that says, in such a case, of course, we will go to third-party independent arbitration. All insurance companies would likely have a provision such as this. Yes, if conflict exists between client A 
and client B, both clients are insured with a different company, an independent arbitrator will be appealed to. And there exists competition in the field of independent arbitration too. That is, no arbitrator can be sure that in the next case of arbitration, he again will be approached with the task of being an arbitrator. Um, but other people can be approached, uh, approached as well. And given the fact that he can be removed from his position, his incentive is indeed to come up with a solution that is regarded as a fair solution by the clients of all companies involved in the dispute, um, because otherwise he will most likely not be chosen again, which again emphasizes this pressure of creating a body of law that is truly, uh, truly universal. We would then have uh, enhanced uh, legal predictability in contrast to ever-changing and flexible uh, legislation. Um, we would have legal certainty uh, instead of uh, uh, flexible, uh, flexible laws. Uh, and I think our um, private security um, and uh, our property or the protection of our property rights would be taken care far better uh, better than uh, than that is the case under the current uh, monopolistic uh, situations. I know that um, uh, these thoughts are familiar to some, so to some they might sound uh, somewhat uh, strange the first time you hear them. Uh, uh, I make you aware of the fact that I have uh, written extensively on this uh, on this subject, um, and uh, of course. Uh, uh, I urge you now to all buy my book if you don't already uh, have it, and I'm perfectly willing to, uh, uh, to sign it. Thank you very much. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.